Good evening, everyone. I hope you can all hear me okay. Um, I think we've got good, a good number in ready to get going, so we'll make a start. Um, my name is Amy and I am the lab manager for Carechester and for Care Liverpool. Um, welcome to your virtual um, information event um, called Paths to Parenthood tonight. So um, it's going to be um, a bit of an interactive session with some videos, um, a presentation um, and a Q&A session where I'll be joined by um, Professor Charles Kingsland. So we're going to cover um, quite a lot. Um, we're going we're gonna to cover the IVF journey as a whole, um, diagnosing um, the fertility problem, treatments with donor eggs, sperm and embryos, um, lab techniques and support at care, funding your treatment, getting started with care, um, and then, as I said, a, a Q&A session to end. So you can ask questions in the um, chat function um, on, on this platform. Um, if you if you ask questions in the chat function, then just be aware that everyone can see them, um, or you can ask them in the questions um, function as well, and that and that way it's private. Um, you can always send us questions via email. So um, we've got a group of people um, behind the scenes who are ready on hand to answer questions for you as we go. Um, so you can also send questions to. Um, an email address, which is events at carefertility.com. Um, if we don't have time to answer your question, obviously we'll try and answer as many as we can. But if we don't have time, then um, we can send a reply to your question via email. Um, and remember as well that we've got the um, new patients team uh, on hand by phone until 8 p.m. tonight. So you can catch them if you, if you want to ask some more questions um, on the phone to someone then you can ask um, them via 0800 564 2270. Okay so I'm just going to start off with a short video um, uh, so this will just be introducing introducing care. Um, so Family it's who we are, and who we're always going to be. It's the important little moments. The big emotions. The beating heart at the centre of our world. It's the journey that we take there. Together. One step at a time. Family is the one thing we'll always care about the most. Because we believe that family is for everyone. And through our care, we'll do everything we can to make your dream real. We don't just care. We are care. Uh, my name is Professor Charles Kingsland and I'm the Group Clinical Director for Care Fertility. At CARE, our number one belief is family for everyone. And this means we do everything possible to help everyone start or grow their family. We know that nothing is as important as family. And that's why we care so much about wanting to give every patient that comes to us their best chance of having a baby. Of course, families come in all shapes and sizes. We get heterosexual couples, couples of the same sex. We get uh, single patients wanting to, uh, to start a family. We get NHS patients. When you have a fertility problem, there should be facilities available for you to get the best advice and the best treatment readily available to give you the best chance of having a baby at a time in your life that is best for you. We will use all our knowledge and experience combined with highly individualized treatment personal treatment to help you have the family you are longing for. Unbeknown to Gemma and I, uh, we both carry a gene, um, a deafness gene. We actually have a daughter um, who, who was three, but who was born prematurely deaf. And we were given the option and chose to go down a fertility treatment to kind of avoid our second child having that same gene. We were very lucky in the fact that 
um, the clinic was only down the road from us. So we felt there was one around the corner. It was had good reviews. We just felt it was good for us, didn't we? The whole package made us just feel really comfortable that actually going with care was the right decision. So the team, the team that we worked with at CARE were unbelievable. They were caring, they were sensitive, they were compassionate, empathetic. Um, and even when I was ringing out with, um, I was feeling pains down one side, that the reassurance that they gave me, uh, they honestly do hold your hand every single step of the way. And I feel like they lived the journey with us. So I've had several treatments with CARE um, I now have a baby and that's taken um, a number of treatments, fertility treatments, different alternatives, different medicines to try and get it to work for me. I have always said I would recommend Care Fertility. I would recommend them for the, the comfort factor that I received, the friendliness and just my, I think the word is my faith in Care Fertility. Okay, so we're going to go into um, the presentation. Um, so, hopefully, everyone can see that okay. Um, so, at CARE, we, we honestly believe that family is for everyone, and we um, understand that it affects a, a, a high number of people. So, one in six couples, which is equates to around 3.5 million people um, in, in the UK. So, we, we do believe that family is for everyone, and we've tried to make this um, uh, achievable with having clinics um, as, as um, far reaching as we can in the UK. So, we've got some. Um, uh, bigger clinics um, in like Sheffield and Nottingham and down south in London and Tunbridge Wells and then we've got lots of little clinics that kind of feed into those so we try and make it um, so that it's care is accessible to, to everyone. We also offer lots of different treatment types to cater for all different types of patients so um, single patients and um, um, couples and same-sex couples um, and treatments with donor eggs and donor sperm. So we're going to go through the IVF process um, and some of the things that are involved in that. And during the presentation, I'm going to refer to the general um, IVF process. And for most people, um, the majority of it will will be um, appropriate. But obviously, um, treatment is very specific to your situation. So there might be slight differences. So it's really easy to get started with care. Um, we've got a um, general inquiries team, um, and this is Shah, our general inquiry team manager, um, and they're always on hand, really knowledgeable, um, and can answer any questions that you have about access and about um, specific treatments that we offer, costs. Um, so it's it's the best place to start is to get in touch with our general inquiry um, team. And as I said earlier, they're available until 8 p.m. tonight um, on the number that I mentioned. Um, but we do have people here answering questions you'll have noticed in the chat. So if you have anything that you'd like to ask quickly, then um, please do. So the first um, part of the IVF process is to obviously get the right diagnosis. So we need to make sure that we're offering you the best treatment um, that we can. We've got lots of different treatments to offer um, and we want to make sure that we're giving you the, the best one and the right one. So we want to take the time to get to know everything about you. We want to know um, your history, if you've had any um, treatment anywhere else, if you've had any tests anywhere else. We've got a secure patient portal which is all online all digital and it's um, kind of like a two-way communication where we can send information to you and you can also send information to us so if you have previous treatment notes or test results then you can upload these to the portal really easily and it means that our um, clinical team have got access to your information um, as soon as as possible so the consultant would review all of this information before your first appointment um, and then you'd come in for your consultation with us um, where we would talk to you um, 
about the results of the tests, if you needed any further tests, and what those tests um, inf tell us about what kind of treatment would be best for you. So during the consultation, we'd listen to your plans, um, your, your timelines, your wishes, um, and we'd discuss the chances of success based on your personal situation. We'll talk to you about support that's available to you and, and any costs um, that would be associated with the treatment. And we'd aim to give you all the time that you needed to ask any questions. Obviously, this is the most important time for you to get um, all of the information that you possibly need to embark on um, on the journey. So. Uh, as I said earlier, the IVF process will be slightly different for everyone, and this is this is the, the basic um, IVF process and will be appropriate for most. Um, but essentially, we start off um, with ovarian stimulation, um, where we want to um, uh, stimulate the ovaries to get um, the eggs uh, out. So usually every month one egg is released but we want to make sure that we get quite a good number of eggs um, so we will recommend a dose um, of um, drug that is suitable for your situation um, and um, we would uh, give you something called a protocol which would be explained to you by the nursing team um, and they would also talk you through how to um, administer your injections to achieve the ovarian stimulation so once you've started the injections, we want to monitor um, the the process to see how um, see how your ovaries are responding. So you'll come in for um, one or two ultrasound scans, um, and that will tell us uh, if your ovaries are producing eggs, um, and when you're ready to have the um, eggs removed. So the monitoring phase usually lasts between three and seven days. Um, you could be on, on the drugs for kind of 10 to 12 days. And when we've done that final monitoring scan and we've decided that your ovaries have sufficiently responded, we would then um, ask you to have the final trigger injection. Um, and this is an important one because it um, triggers um, the process uh, of ovulation. Obviously, you don't get to the point of ovulation because we collect the eggs before that happens. Um, but it's an important part of the process to make sure that the eggs are ready to come into the lab. So once you've taken the trigger injection, the egg collection happens about 36 hours later. So it's a straightforward procedure. Um, you should be um, in the procedure room for um, 20 to 30 minutes. It depends how, how you've responded. If you've got lots and lots of follicles, um, then you may be in there for a little longer. Um, but essentially, an ultrasound um, guides a needle um, into the ovaries, so um, through the vaginal wall into the ovaries, and we um, aspirate or, or suck out the fluid that should hopefully have an egg um, inside and you can see the black um, parts on the scan images they're the um, follicles that should contain an egg so once the egg collection's finished um, it's 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 done under um, sedation in, in, in most places um, and you'll be given pain relief um, and after a short rest you should be um, fit and well to go home um, and take it easy at home for a little while so once we've got the eggs, we obviously need the sperm and we want to create embryos in most cases. So uh, we would then um, look to um, prepare the sperm sample. And the sample is usually given at the same time as the egg collection. That obviously differs if frozen sperm is being used or if we've surgically retrieved sperm from the testes. Um, in in current times with the with COVID, uh, we are recommending that samples are produced at home and brought in and dropped off at the clinic um, in time as the egg collection. So um, we once we've got the um, sperm uh, and the eggs, I think I've got a short uh, video on the sperm, actually. Let me just see if I can load that up for you. Yes. 
So this is a machine called a computer-aided semen analysis machine. So you can see um, the sperm on the images uh, swimming around and there's little blue lines uh, following the sperm afterwards. And that tells us how well the sperm are swimming, if they're swimming in the right direction and how competent we think they are at um, fertilizing the eggs. And then over further on the um, right hand side, that's telling us how the sperm look. So the computer is assessing the sperm head and the neck and the tail. Um, and that tells us if the um, way that the sperm looks is, is good as well. So we, as I said, the aim is to um, create embryos. So we need to put the eggs and the sperm together. And we do this in two ways. Um, so one way is um, the basic IVF procedure. And that's where the sperm sample um, is of sufficient quality, um, where we've got enough moving um, sperm to place the sperm and the eggs together in a dish uh, and leave them to um, do what they need to do overnight. The other process is ICSI, um, and that's where we manually inject a single sperm into each one of the mature eggs. And this is a little bit more involved um, and is usually recommended for um, patients who have got a low sperm count, low sperm numbers, or low motility, so low movement, or a low morphology, so the way that the sperm look. And that's just to ensure that we're maximising the chances of um, the fertilisation process happening. So I've got a video of the ICSI procedure to show you how we do ICSI. So you can see an egg um, being held in place and then a sperm just coming down the, the needle on the right. And then the needle's pushed into the middle of the egg and we suck up a little bit of the egg just to make sure that the outer membrane breaks so that the sperm is can be deposited. And then the sperm's put into the centre of the egg and the needle is gently removed. So we would do that for each one of the mature eggs um, that were collected. So once we've got fertilization, hopefully a good number of the eggs would fertilize. The fertilization rate is anywhere between 60 and 70 percent. Um, some people get more and some people get less. But once we've um, created the embryos, we want to watch them develop and we want to make sure that they're developing as they should um, and that we are um, choosing the absolute best embryo um, for, your, for your treatment. So the embryologists are the ones that monitor the embryos um, and we keep you updated with the development. So we call you um, at, at kind of day, a couple of day intervals. So we'd call you to let you know about fertilization. And then we'd like to call you again on a couple of days after that on when the embryos would be day three. And then a couple of days after that, again, when the embryos would be a blastocyst, which is what you can see down in the bottom right hand side of that image. So it's interesting to, to know how, um, I suppose, how fertilization, how we see fertilization. And the image in the top left hand corner here, um, you can see that the, the egg, uh, and then you can, perhaps you should be able to see two smaller circles in the middle. Um, and that's the DNA, the chromosomes from the sperm and the egg coming together um, and creating um, an embryo that is unique. So there's a chance that you'll get lots uh, or a good number of embryos and we need to be able to choose uh, which one is the best to transfer and maximise your chances of um, a, a pregnancy early or quickly. So there's two things that we do at CARE um, that we think help maximise the chances of success in, in some cases. So firstly, um, we do CARE Maps. Um, and CARE Maps is um, a piece of software and equipment that we have um, that monitors the embryos continuously for the entire culture period. So from um, day, day one or day zero all the way up to when the embryos are used and the um, incubator that they're kept in has a camera that takes a picture of the embryos every five to ten minutes. And what we end up with is a, essentially a video of, the, of every embryo's development 
and that gives us loads of information about how competent the embryo is. And we have developed, based on the huge amounts of data that CARE have, we've developed a piece of software that can identify um, in a group of embryos which one has the highest chance of a live birth. And that's based on things that the that um, humans um, don't necessarily um, aren't necessarily that good at seeing. So it's the timings of um, the cell divisions and when it reaches certain stages. So the other um, technology that we use is something called PGTA, and that's um, shown in the picture on the right hand side. And that's where we would remove five to seven cells from a developing embryo around the day five stage. So when it's at the blastocyst stage and we'd send those cells away for genetic testing. So the embryo would be frozen and um, the cells would be sent away for testing. And then once we got the received the results back, um, it would tell us whether the embryo was chromosomally normal or not. And based on those results, we can obviously um, transfer the embryos that are chromosomally abnormal, uh, chromosomally normal um, preferentially. So if you have 10 embryos and we did PGTA, the likelihood is that maybe three or four of them would be normal. And then we can remove the, the remaining six or seven um, and, and not transfer them. So once we have decided which embryo is the best, um, we would go ahead and um, perform the embryo transfer. Um, I believe I've got a short video of um, embryo development as well, um, just before we go on. So yeah, this is an, um, a video of an embryo developing in the CareMap system. So this is around day four of development now. And we're starting to see the cells um, divide into the into the two cell lines that we need to see, which is the mass of cells that becomes the baby, which is forming at about three o'clock now, moving to about four o'clock. Um, and then um, the outer cells around the outside. Um, and that, that mass of cells now is sitting at about two o'clock up at the top. So that's what we would call a blastocyst. Um, and you can see how the um, the video gives us lots and lots of information about the embryo development to help us maximise your chances of success. So embryo transfers are, are mostly done under ultrasound. Um, so we make sure that the catheter uh, is going into the right place. It's a very soft catheter and um, it's loaded with the embryo or embryos um, and inserted through the vagina and the cervix and then into the womb. So it, it's a very straightforward procedure, 15 minutes usually, and you can carry on as normal afterwards. You don't need to lie down um, or, or rest. Um, we just say carry on um, as if you, as if you would. And then following the embryo transfer, it's the two week wait um, for you to perform your pregnancy test. So um, we give you progesterone tablets that support um, the implantation um, process. And then your pregnancy test is about, um, well, it's a couple of weeks uh, after the embryo transfer. And we obviously ask that you get in touch with us and let us know the outcome. And then based on that, we would bring you in for a scan um, uh, around the five to six week mark. And that will tell us if there's a um, heartbeat um, from the transfer. Um, obviously, we would hope that the transfer was successful, but if it's not in some cases, which, which it isn't, Obviously, there's the support for you all, all the way along and um, you can give your care clinic a call at any point in your journey um, and we have counsellors um, on hand to provide you with support um, when you need it. If the um, test is positive and you have a scan result, um, then we would discharge you to your GP and um, wish you well and ask that you get back in touch and let, let us know um, how it all goes. So that's a quick rundown of the um, IVF journey, um, pro the IVF process really. 
Um, so I'm just going to talk about some additional things that we do at CARE. So donation um, at, at, at CARE, we've got a, a really big donation programme in terms of um, donated eggs and donated sperm. And we know that there's many, many different um, reasons that you might need to use donor eggs, donor sperm or even donor embryos. So we really like to um, keep the donation service um, going with with care so we've got over 25 years worth of experience and we've helped more people start a family with the help of a donor than any other clinic um, we support you through the entire journey if you need to use donor eggs and donor sperm um, all the way from from your initial consultation your initial questions through to helping you select your donor and um, specialist counseling um, and all the way through the ivf process so we, the counselling appointments are free um, uh, for, for when you need them. We, we recognise that it's emotional time and um, sometimes um, talking with someone helps. So we like to provide that service um, free. And then we've got lots of other initiatives um, in the care group for um, support. So we have a care buddy system. So that's where you would be buddied up with someone else going through the fertility journey around the same kind of time um, and you can talk to each other about your experiences. We run regular events um, and online support groups. Um, we've been trying to get back to doing some in-person um, support groups. So we do um, support walks um, in, at various, various clinics. Uh, obviously with COVID, things have had to be done outside. But um, we do regularly run um, lots of support events. We've got a 24-7 care online forum. So you can chat with other care patients um, at, at any point. Um, and you've always got the support of your care clinic, your care team. Um, whichever clinic you decide to go to, they should be um, on hand, ready to provide you with the support and, and point you in the direction of further support if you needed it. So the other thing we'd like to try and support you with is the financial aspect of IVF. Um, it's not um, it's not cheap um, and sometimes it can be inaccessible. So we have an initiative called Care Pay. And this is an exclusive IVF funding program to make the funding of the treatment easier to manage. So we offer different um, treatment packages based on your on your circumstances. It's individu individually tailored, um, designed to give you the financial peace of mind, um, knowing that you've got a plan in place um, and you know how much treatment you you can get based on um, based on your package. So we created CarePay following feedback that it was disruptive to have to go to an external company for, for funding. Um, and CarePay is entirely managed in-house. Um, so we have a CarePay team. Um, it's not outsourced. So you have a essentially a more experience um, all the way from initial consultation right to the very end. Okay, so um, I think that's covered everything for the presentation. Um, so we're going to go to the Q&A session now. So I think Professor Kingsland should be joining us shortly. We've had um, a good number of questions coming in um, so far. Oh, here he is. Hello, Hi, Professor. Amy. Hi, how are you? Good, thanks. Are you? I'm fine, thank you. I like your glasses tonight. Oh, do you like... They the match my theatre gear, don't they? Yeah, they look good. <laughs> There's so, lots, of, lots and lots of questions, aren't there? So loads. Do we jump in? Shall I? Shall I make a start? So yeah. um, we, we've had a question on the um, on the chat to ask what protocol would be used for a patient with a very low AMH around five point four. Okay. Well. AMH stands for anti-malarian hormone, and anti-malarian hormone is the hormone that's secreted by the little cells that surround the eggs. So the more AMH you've got, the more eggs you've got. It doesn't tell you about the quality of the eggs, it just tells you about the quantity. And there are lots of other things that might predict what the, um, what the quality may be before we actually take your eggs out. So the most important determining factor is age, because eggs deteriorate with age. So it's, so it's, 
much better to have a low AMH and be 20 and or as opposed to a high AMH and be 45, for example, because the chances are once if you have a lot of eggs when you're 45, they're probably not as good quality as a small amount when you're 20. So there are lots of other factors that we need to, to, to consider when we're talking about low AMHs, age being important lifestyle whether you smoke your weight all these factors add in and and so the amh is just one single aspect of looking at the overall prognosis or your chance of of getting uh, pregnant is so what i would say to this patient is seek advice um, and take all the other factors into consideration so that your doctor or nurse practitioner can give you the best idea what your chances are before you make the decision to go ahead yeah um so another question um is it okay to is it okay to run i, I started around the of January, being advised not to run so i walk <laughs> <laughs> i run i walk and i've not been advised to but anyway um yeah if you've if you've if, if if you're used to to doing vigorous exercise before IVF and it and it makes you feel good and it has a positive effect on your on your well being, so be it. That's fine. All we say is when you when you undergo the IVF treatment, you know it's it's emotionally taxing, it's physically taxing. So you need to conserve your energy and redirect it to all the parts of your body that need it. So your pelvis, your ovaries, um, your eggs. And so that would be, um, you know, indicative of just just taking it easy. Try not to not try not to do too much exercise during the procedure, and certainly after the procedure, when your hormones might be might be um, you know at an elevated level, which which means that you need to take things easy, and also for your for your mental well being as well, because once you're going through IVF, you need to concentrate on the IVF, and if you need other other recreational things to to take your mind away from it just be gentle be, be kind to yourself at that particular time but before keep in training as long as it's not too drastic yeah i think that's a good point that it's personal isn't it what you're used to and what makes you feel happy that's right carry on doing yeah. and we get lots of questions from patients after transfer don't we oh it's not going to fall out is it and they're no. worried about you know doing vigorous exercise and it having an effect that's right what you have to remember is the embryo is so small it will sit on the head of a pin sit on the the sharp end of a pin so that when you stand up after your embryo transfer the embryo actually floats upwards so so as you're standing upright the embryo actually goes up like a bubble in a bottle of a pop but um, so it won't fall out because it's held in a very very thin suspension of of fluid as well. So it, it goes upwards. But you're not going to, you know don't go skydiving or or doing some extreme sports. Take it easy. Take it easy. Um, I had a round of IVF which had um, no blastocysts. Is there oh. anything differently or ask for in my next cycle? Well. And as I said to the to the to the first question, there are lots of factors that might have been in play when you got your um, your low um, fertilization rate. What your AMH was, your age, your um, whether you were taking any medication, whether you had any other illnesses. So you need to look at what happened and use the information that's been gained from that cycle of IVF to modify your next one and give you the best chance because don't forget if it's if it's not if it's not been successful we've probably learned a lot of information about your sperm your eggs how they interact and what we can do to improve the outcome with the next one so your follow-up consultation um, will be key in determining what to do next yeah and the, a follow-up to that the AMH um, with the low AMH is there still any hope um, and I think I well I would say that yes we we do we we do treat patients who have got very very low AMH so yeah. we've got things available for, for specific patients like that haven't we yeah there's always there's always hope as long as people don't make false promises and you've got a realistic idea as what your chances are based on your low AMH then it's up to you 
to decide whether you're going to take that, whether, whether you want to take that chance. But the, the idea is to be realistic about, about your outcomes. Yeah. So on to, uh, in, I guess, in that same vein, there are so many amazing treatment extras to choose from. Would these be recommended based on test results in the first consultation or potentially only after failed cycles? No, they would be um, at CARE. We would advise you about um, evidence-based treatments and non-evidence-based treatments, which may be... Oh. ...that unequivocally are good for you. Um, and are they going to do you good? Like taking folic acid, that's a no-brainer. Stopping smoking, trying to get your weight down. These are evidence-based, clear factors which improve your outcome. Then there's a whole host of non-evidence-based stuff that may be a benefit, it may not be a benefit, but as long as it's not harmful, then you can um, be at liberty to choose what you think is best for you with together with the advice from your nurse practitioner or your doctor or indeed... Um, your embryologist. Yeah, well, and I think um, I think that's really important that we do have a lot of tests to offer, but we wouldn't necessarily offer them to everyone first off. It's really exactly. important that you get the information um, and you make an informed decision about what's going to work for you. Yeah, exactly. Um, what are the differences between a day three embryo and a day five embryo? Well, I'm not really uh, the expert on this one. So can I ask the question? What are the differences between a day three and a day five embryo? Amy. Thank you. Um, so a day three embryo um, has around six to eight cells. So an, an embryo starts off with one cell and then it divides into two and it divides into four and it divides into eight. And around the day three stage, we want to see around eight cells. By the time we get to day five, it should have over 100 cells. So it's kind of like an exponential growth. The embryo divides and divides and divides. And by the time we get to day five, it should be at the blastocyst stage. Most of the embryo transfers that we do are on embryos that have reached the blastocyst stage because we believe that um, is a it's demonstration that the embryos are most competent. They're the most likely to create a pregnancy. We rarely do day three transfers, um, but we may do in the cases where you have one embryo, um, and uh, we we don't need to do any kind of selection. We don't need to leave them for any longer. If it, if there's just one, we know that's the one that's going to be transferred. We may do a day three transfer, but usually we do day five, um, especially if the embryos are in care maps, because then we get loads of information um, when they're in care maps for five days, and we can give you a score from one to ten um, that tells you um, what the chance of a live birth is from that. Ooh. Sorry about uh, that. <laughs> Sorry. Right. Probably so, my dinner's ready. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we've got a question about TSH. Come back at two point eight nine. It's very specific. Yeah, um, there's a yeah, there's a there's a there's a a, 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 a range in which TSH is thyroid stimulating hormone, and your thyroid gland is intimately involved in um, reproduction, and we like the TSH to be at a particular level that indicates that your hormonal orchestra is all moving in sync. 2.89 is is fine, but, but there again, everybody is an individual. So if you've got a thyroid problem, you might be on thyroxine, that may be, um, affect, you might affect your TSH. Um, so my advice to you would be, ask the doctor and the nurses that are looking after you, if, if your TSH and your thyroid function is within normal limits and optimum for your IVF outcome. Okay, I think last question. I think we've, yeah, we've hit the time frame. I think. So last yeah. question. Um, I've had a persistent hydrocelpinx which cannot be removed. Would this change the treatment approach? Well, um, the, the, the hydrocelpinx is where you've got fluid in a fallopian tube and it's, it's um the, the fact that it's that, that it's there and you've noticed it, it does it can have a detrimental effect on the implantation of an embryo because the theory is that little bits of fluid might drip into the you uterine cavity and disrupt the implantation now if your hydrosalpinx can't be removed and it's big 
um, then it might be worthwhile just clipping it, just putting a little clip on the end of the tube to stop that flow of fluid into your endometrium. Um, if that's not possible, well, we, you know, we used to do lots of IVF in the prenzified salpingis, and um, that is, um, that's okay. But my advice to you would be to seek other ways of, of if you can't, if it can't be removed, clip it, and that will stop that will block the, the flow of fluid into your endometrial cavity if you can. Mm. I'm going to squeeze another one in. Sorry, because it's just through. Sorry. Yeah. Um, so I've been advised for the last three years not to get pregnant due to an autoimmune condition. Right. I've now been given a tentative green light, but she's 41 and feels like the odds are stacked against her. Do you think it's sensible to egg freeze now and then try naturally so she has a plan B in case things aren't successful naturally? Um, my advice to you would be not to um, to to think about egg freezing. If you've had an autoimmune disease, that you know that can be pretty nasty, and it can have a detrimental effect on your on your ovaries. The fact that you're 41, um, and um, if your AMH is good, whatever. If you want a family, time is of the essence. So I wouldn't I wouldn't necessarily freeze your eggs. It's not the best time to freeze them. Usually, uh, egg freezing is is reserved for people under the women under the age of 35 that gives you the best results the age of 41 it's much better to crack on with treatment if your autoimmune problem has been stabilized so that would be my advice to to, to you yep perfect all right well thank you very much pleasure very much. thank you for inviting me amy no worries nice to see you and you i'm okay. dismissed now aren't i you are thank you <laughs> bye. bye everybody good luck Okay, so hopefully that was helpful um, and we managed to answer questions. If we haven't, um, then we can get back to you via email um, and feel free to ring the number that's open until 8 p.m. Um, if, you, if you didn't feel like your question was answered. So we'll end with a couple of final videos, um, just a little information about um, care. Uh, so we're gonna hear from Shah, um, who you saw earlier, um, and also from our um, chief, chief executive, who is Dave. So I'm just going to find the video. Okay. I'm Shah, and I manage CARE's new patient inquiry team. We're here to make it easy for you to take your very first step in your fertility journey. We completely understand how nervous and excited you might be when you contact us. This is the start of a life-changing process and hopefully the beginning of an amazing future as a family. So it's really important that we give you all the information you need. That way, we can help you to feel much more comfortable and confident with your treatment. Whatever you need to talk about, I want to reassure you that no question is silly or trivial. We appreciate that there might be a lot to take in at first, but don't worry, we'll send you a clear information pack about the treatments you're interested in, and we're always here for any follow-up queries. My team also manage inquiries about care pay, our range of funding packages which are exclusive to care fertility patients. When you're ready, we can book you a virtual consultation with a specialist fertility doctor from your local care clinic. So if you want more information, have a question or wish to book an appointment, call my team. We want you to know that we are here for you at every stage of your fertility journey. We say that our patients become part of our care family and it's true. We care deeply about you and your future and our teams are here to make sure you have all the support you need. The reason why we chose CARE was just one, the care that they give you, um, the aftercare that they have available to you, and the fact that they um, offer different forms of um, treatment um, and they listen to you. One thing that I've identified and what I've noticed when speaking to other um, people that I've met within the infertility community is there's a lot of clinics out there that don't necessarily listen to you as the patient. It was kind of a one size fits all, but with care that didn't seem to be the case at all. They took everything into consideration and they listened um, to your concerns. They listened to you as a person and they put a, a package and, and a process in place that will help you and, you know, fingers crossed will give you that positive result from the at the end of it so without a shadow of a doubt if I had to go through it again I would definitely go back to care
Oh, the support at care was brilliant. Was brilliant. Yeah. I mean, the nurses were brilliant for us. You feel so looked after. Yeah, cared by and, and cared by by the whole team. We felt that they did care, and it wasn't just for them mm. getting something out of it. It was actually that ongoing support. Really. Yeah, and they wanted it to work for us. Care Fertility started over 20 years ago with one clinic and the goal of helping patients achieve their dream of family through truly personal care and the most scientifically advanced fertility treatments. We've grown from that one clinic. We now have clinics across the UK and many people have become part of our care family with over 50,000 care babies in the world. But one thing has and always will remain the same. We care for each and every patient we care about your dreams of having a baby and we put our heart and soul into every aspect of what care can offer you. To provide you with the best care possible and to give you your best chance of success and treatment, we look to our own care family. From our consultants, embryologists and nurses to our admin teams and specialist fertility counsellors, we've also put a lot of thought into how we improve each and every step of your journey, which will no doubt begin with lots of questions. We know that thinking about starting IVF can be daunting for some, and that's why our care, patient services and support teams will always be there for you whenever you have a question, need advice or simply want someone to talk to so that you feel completely confident and in control of your fertility options. So yes, we have grown and developed over the years, but care and empathy are always at the heart of who we are. We are passionate about changing lives and creating futures and I hope that this shines through in everything we do and everyone you meet at all of our clinics. We don't just care, we are care. Okay, so thank you everyone for attending. I hope it was useful. I um, hope it gave you a good overview of what you can expect um, with treatment at care. Um, we've posted further information, further contact details, telephone numbers, email address, websites. Um, we've got people on the line until 8 p.m. Feel free to give them a call um, and we'll leave you with a few words um, about a um, few final words about care and how you can get in touch and book an appointment. One in six people need help to grow their family. You're not alone. And our care family will do everything we can to help your dream of family come true. There are over 50,000 care babies in the world today. And behind this success is our promise to make more heartfelt dreams of family become reality by ensuring our care goes into everything we do for all our patients every single day. You will receive truly individualized treatment, a patient-centric approach with empathy at its heart. We understand how nervous and excited you might be about getting started but you can be assured of kindness, empathy, and all the information you need from our new patient inquiry team. We are all here to make it easy for you to take your very first step in your fertility journey. Call our team on 0800 564 2270 to learn more and book an appointment. We don't just care, we are care.